China made its name and got its growth by becoming the destination for cheap labor. However, in recent years, the attitude has shifted and China has become too expensive. And it, now it's cheaper to make things in Bangladesh, Vietnam, or maybe Greenland. We're lacking data, so it's hard to say. This is an intentional yet controversial push from China to escape the middle income trap and finally become wealthy. But just like with your friend and his new briefcase full of cash, it'd be reasonable to ask if this is even possible in any legitimate way. These culturally similar countries all show up as green on a GDP per capita map, and these countries are also famous for plundering the world. This is how wealth is formed, by taking it from other nations, at least according to the average demographic of a college campus. However, even though it can feel natural to come to this conclusion, since imperialism was a real part of human history, with many natural resources literally being shipped across oceans to Europe, and there are many atrocities to cement this. As a European, let me just say, don't look into those atrocities. However, it's important to dispel this myth, because if we can understand Understand what actually made countries rich, we'd be able to address the global inequality that this graph represents, and maybe while we're at it anyway, we could keep our own countries rich. This seems like a better idea than simply self-flagellating over the idea we probably did something bad over a hundred years ago, and so let's look at the plundering theory, aka the only way to get rich is to commit crimes and rob your neighbours. <laughs> Historical GDP is not a perfect measure, and most estimates do have variability for obvious reasons, but even with a margin of error included, you can see back in 1820, all countries were poor per person. There is a gap that you can see, but whatever countries did to get rich happened somewhere closer to the modern age than to 1820, which is when countries were still actively plundering each other, slavery was booming in the Americas, and land was being stolen from native people en masse. In other words, crime was happening all of the time, but it wasn't making people drastically richer. In fact, the average person would frequently get sick without effective treatment, all sorts of foods weren't available for most of the year, and in fact, eating was enough of a struggle by itself. The global wealth inequality was much lower too, so it's not just that the rich people had everything. Indeed, rich people still had to use the bathroom in the street, maybe a small outhouse if they were very luxurious, and international travel was something that would take weeks out of your life, and to anyone, no matter how much money you had, basic modern day essentials that even the poorest have now were entirely unattainable, partially because lots of them hadn't been invented yet. That's right, the joy of leaving an angry YouTube comment and trying to upset someone on the internet was just an impossible feat in the early 1820s. Uh, but what exactly was it that actually changed this then? Well, revolution. When you think of the biggest revolutions in history, the Bolsheviks or Maoists may come to mind, but the real biggest was not a political one, but rather an economic. For all but 200 years of human history, we've been required to spend huge amounts of time growing food, creating clothes, and manufacturing everything else by hand. We spend much more time at the crafting table than the loom or the book and quill. The industrial revolution is when the machines took over. And looking at the wealth divide in Europe, it's clear which countries industrialized first because there's this perfect wave of green to yellow to red as you go from west to eastern Europe, perfectly matching the spread of the industrial revolution, except for Portugal, which is eastern Europe. But it perfectly matches the spread, and so it gives you a very clear answer to point to, which is that, yeah, I guess over here they hadn't industrialized when these places had been industrialized for 40 plus years. All of Europe industrialized behind, before most of the rest of the world, but still you might be questioning why would the Russian uh, you know, people not be industrializing when it's such a key part of success that is clearly happening in the rest of the continent? And the answer is generally given to be that the ruling class in Russia at the time were much more concerned about having more control over uh, the farming peasants of the country with their sickles than about bringing up their living standards so they could be in uh, factories of hammers instead, and thank god there were no revolutions in uh, Russia that would lead to the hammer and the sickle being combined, because then there'd be more atrocities that we'd have to not talk about in this video. Uh, but instead, you can say that even by the time of World War I and World War II, Russia, despite having a much larger land area than all of the other European powers put together, uh, despite having a large population than any other European country, it was about on equal footings with its allies in both those wars, France and the United Kingdom, which is wild to say, but it's because they saw that the number of people they had, their human capital, as just another resource. This is one of the depressing reasons why so many Russians died uh, during World War II. They are the largest individual group, uh, and it is one of the uh, big uh, kind of scars that it left on that country, uh, being seen as disposable because it was just kind of treated so by the governments of the time. But the point to say is that to be productive on a per-person basis, as opposed to just as a whole, one of the important things you need to do is improve the ability of each person. And so if we take 
take a uh, glance at this map uh, on a, it's GDP per capita and it's per region rather than per country, because this is savings, it's wealth, it's per country, it's, it's easy to look at, but this is a much more granular view, and you can see that some areas industrialize much better than others, but you can also see some weird exceptions to the rule we mentioned earlier. Um, obviously, Italy and Spain can be explained by the fact that, like, well, actually, they were outside the wave of industrialization, uh, and you can look at the, though at then at, like, Wales, for example, and say, well, they, they should be in that first wave. They're right here during the Industrial Revolution. How is Wales not incredibly wealthy? And uh, instead, why is it that this random region of Scotland, northeast here, near Aberdeen, is wealthy? And the answer is why Wales is coal could perhaps... Uh, <laughs> sorry, the answer why Wales is poor could perhaps be explained by coal. Wales is coal, you might even say. Um, this was used to fuel the Industrial Revolution, but it's been seen as much less valuable now. It led to a boom in wealth, but then the resource money went away, which is one of the critical Citizens people have of a lot of wealthy nations. Indeed, if you look at this green area, this green area, and indeed, if you look at the world map, you can see some countries are getting wealthy in the modern era without massively industrializing, but instead by having something the whole world wants. And this is a really great idea if you're Saudi Arabia, if you're the UAE, and you know, you might think like, yeah, oil is just the way you make money forever, but as you can see from this graph looking at Wales, it actually doesn't work forever, right? It, it, it doesn't work uh, in perpetuity, and instead, there is a point where your resource won't be wanted by the world. This is a, another problem, economically speaking, for another time. It is a very, very big one that is solved by sovereign wealth funds. Wow, we discussed that in the first episode of the series. Uh, but there's also uh, another interesting point here, which is that actually the only long-term sustainable success, as seen by all of Europe that is friends of the United States, because looking back at this map, actually, uh, you know, one of the other things that really separates the green from the yellows and the reds are the fact that the United States is friends with the these guys and gave them money to rebuild and these people weren't allowed to take loans from the US because of these guys over there. And so uh, really if you look at them and then you look at Japan and South Korea also given huge loans to rebuild after the war, actually that's how you become wealthy. It's not directly that you've got to steal from the world, it's that you've got to have a colony that had its own colonies and that they take from the world and then redistribute it. Being friends of the US is the only way to become wealthy, except there's obviously quite a few exceptions to that rule, i.e. countries that are very very successful, despite not necessarily being on great terms with the United States. There's one very big example that has a lot of Chinese people inside of it. I'm of course talking about Singapore, but first let's talk about Vietnam, which is an example where the US really doesn't like these guys. They're literally a communist country. They went to war with them and they had thousands of their soldiers killed in that war. And even though they lost it and should be very bitter right now, actually it's a very successful example of a country which has developed very quickly. Also, Singapore is another great example of somewhere that used to be a poor fishing village and refueling stop to becoming one of the major manufacturing and refining centers of the region to being the finance center of Asia. Disneyland with the death penalty sounds real bad, but this first half is pretty impressive if you ignore the second half, and you better believe we're gonna do that. South Africa is another example of a country that is absolutely shunned internationally. It had one of the least popular policies in the entire world. It was so bad, in fact, that one of the most famous African Americans is from there, but one of the interesting things about South Africa is the fact that it had an apartheid, it had a terrible policy of wanting to develop nuclear weapons, but despite both of these things and despite the turmoil that has happened since, it is still a successful nation. Or it was still a successful nation. It's probably actually the first example of a country which was rich but is probably going to end up middle income, and so this isn't a perfectly fair list since Vietnam is also in that category, and any other famous example you can name, like Brazil or Thailand, are also stuck there. Stuck where, you might ask? The middle income trap. Moving a country out of poverty is fairly easy. Build some basic infrastructure, move people into cities, and get them to manufacture something, knowing that even if you pay triple the average salary for a worker, you're still paying less than the minimum wage in every nation you could compete with. At the point where all of your people are poor, offering them any amount of money on the global stage is a great deal, and as long as you have easy access to a port, this is a way out of international poverty that doesn't even require plunder oil or bold eagles. Moving from being a Congo to a Cambodia is easy in other words, but what is much harder is working your way from a Swaziland to a Switzerland, as it is something that countries are trying all of the time to varying degrees of success. This is because once you start participating in the global economy, you quickly start to be at the whims of companies 
domestic and international, which have the exact opposite interests to you. While many nations have tried through policy, preventing an emerging middle class from buying brand name jeans, phones, or financial services from abroad is surprisingly hard. Additionally, as a country gets richer and its average wages rise, it now struggles to improve living standards without being outcompeted by poorer nations on cost. This is the crux of the middle income trap, to have a workforce that is well paid and educated uh. enough not to be the cheapest destination, but also not enough well paid or compensated to be the very best. China's biggest effort over the past few decades have been towards exactly this goal, escaping the middle income trap. But how do you do that? This is one of the least fortunate places to be in. It's analogous to having made your way out of poverty by getting a job in fast food, but being unable to break your way into the big lead job that you really want. Although to follow that analogy even further, here is what it looks like for people. This is a graph from the Federal Reserve of Cleveland that breaks people down into their quintile of income, i.e. their income when broken down into 20% groups of the population. The richest 20% are the first quintile, the second richest are the second, and the poorest 20% are the fifth. This simple break breakdown can be used to show that the majority of people end up in the same wealth bracket that they were born into, or at the very least the same income bracket. However, it also shows that a substantial number of people do slowly improve or downgrade their livelihood. 40% of third quintile people end up in the second or fourth quintile, and 41% of fourth quintile people end up in the third and fifth. There is a degree of stickiness, but it's still very possible to improve. The richest and poorest ends of the spectrum have the highest stickiness, and I suspect if this broke down into even even more than just quintiles, you'd see this even higher at the richest and poorest ends of that. But in the middle, it tends to be most fluid, which is the opposite of how it works with countries. Because in 2013, the World Bank published a report stating that of the 101 middle income economies in 1960, only 13 became high income by 2008. This is a shocking statistic with 13% of success in going from middle to upper income, which is less than what we see within the individual country of the United States you saw earlier. But the secrets to success in high income countries is usually the high concentration of skilled people in one area, which can explain much of the draw of Los Angeles for actors, London for finance people, or your mum's house for OnlyFans subscribers, but achieving this in a developing country can be very hard as it takes a lot of time and most importantly, investment. One of the tragic realities of growth is that investment is what is required to make the future better than today, but people are much happier with short term consumption. They both have the same impact on net aggregate output and and so the rulers of a country can make hard decisions and improve infrastructure for the long term, but as they are elected on five year cycles, the benefits of short term spending is felt by them, while the debt is felt by their successors. In the case of investments, it's the reverse. The long term benefit is felt by their successor, whereas the short term downsides and trade offs in spending is felt by them. In effect, democracies have the same problem Imperial Russia had, and instead of choosing to keep the peasants happy with vodka, uh, they are instead choosing to keep the people at their current income level because many of them will actively choose to do so and in a democracy it is in their benefits to listen to the voters but the only real solution to this is to have a country that is either not on the democratic path which isn't necessarily what I would be agree with or to have a populace that actively chooses to make investments that will grow the country as opposing to choosing policies that will benefit your team's voters in the short term only. It goes without saying but no matter the size of your slice of the pie everyone benefits from a bigger economy and everyone fails when the economy contracts. But I guess that's just a theory. A country theory. Sorry, I've always wanted to say that. But that is the middle income trap that China is desperately trying to escape. They have gotten themselves out of the poverty trap and into the middle income club. However, from here, they need to continue to convince their populace that investing in China is best for the future, and they need to make those investments into infrastructure, education, and everything else that is required for the country to succeed. This is something that requires opening up the economy, at least in every other developed country's case, or it requires them to be the very first country that can do so while being relatively closed off from the world. Which one is it going to be is something that is very hard to actually determine at this point, but that is China's plan to escape the middle income trap, and the only way to be sure of whether they succeed is looking at the next 20 to 30 years. For now, I hope you will enjoyed the second episode of How Countries Work, and do consider subscribing because as opposed to my usual videos where second channel don't care, these do take a lot of work and do say thank you to Naito too if you've been enjoying these because this has been uh, How Countries Work episode 2 and I look forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks for episode 3. Goodbye.